I talked about a demand trend in protein. And then I shifted very quickly to food prices. Well, there's a lot of food that's not protein. There's vegetarians, there's all sorts of people in the world that don't eat protein. I'm not sure that it matters. Here's why. Many of you in this room will probably are aware, but for every pound of chicken you eat, that chicken consumed two pounds of feed, most likely grain. For every pound of pork you eat, that pig consumed, the folks at Tyson's take issue with the four, they say it's 3.3, whatever, it's more than one. <laughs> um, it's somewhere between three and four is the ratio of grains and feed that go into the pig to produce a pound of pork. And then beef, eight is the ratio. God help us if the world consumes beef. We won't have enough grain to feed the animals, let alone ourselves. Well, you have to stop and also ask the question. So, you know, Michael Pollan's a food writer, famous food writer, has written a bunch of bestsellers. Uh, he says, you are what you eat, eats. You think you're eating beef, you're eating corn. I'm going to say push that logic a little further. Here's Vikram's little footnote to Michael Pollan's statement. You are what you eat, eats, eats. What does the corn have to eat? Corn has to have fertilizers, sunlight, water, a couple other things. So let's look at fertilizers for just one moment. What you see is a really interesting dynamic. Nitrogen fertilizers, there's plenty of nitrogen. This room has plenty of nitrogen. You just need energy to fix it into a usable format by the plant. Okay, so that's not a problem, particularly in light of the current energy boom. But the other two ingredients plants need are potassium and phosphorus. Potassium is not spread evenly in the world. Potash is the, the usable format, heavily concentrated in Canada and Belarus slash Russia. Okay, so that's, at least it's not concentrated in one place. But phosphorus, water-soluble phosphorus mined in phosphate rock format, here's the global distribution of water-soluble phosphorus. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, 75% roughly of proven reserves proven reserves that we know of today in the world are in Morocco and the Western Sahara. That makes Morocco more powerful in the land of fertilizer and likely food than OPEC ever was in the land of oil. That's scary. There are already organizations in Arizona and Australia that are calling for peak phosphorus. If you do a Google search for peak phosphorus, you'll see there are serious academics that have extrapolated the trends and said, this is a serious issue that no one's paying attention to. We need to pay attention. Phosphorus is a big problem. By the way, in case you don't have a decent sense of your, of your African geography, Morocco and the Western Sahara, which is on the sort of northwestern corner of Africa, they're not thought to be one nation by the United Nations. The UN thinks of them as two separate nations. The US calls them one. There's political instability. They're, they border Mali, which has a war going on. This doesn't make you feel good. And by the way, if I know this, and there's academics studying this, for sure there are geostrategic and political leaders thinking about this as well. What happens when people start actually acquiring strategic fertilizer reserves? We have strategic petroleum reserves to offset the pain of driving down the street if prices were to rise too rapidly. What about if food prices were to rise? That seems more destabilizing. And what happens when countries start to acquire these reserves? Do you create the hoarding mentality that results in making that you know, pinch and demand happen? It's possible. I think there are countries doing this right now.